facebook.com slash book tv up next on book tv lewis gordon talks about the life and philosophy of france fanon author of the wretched of the earth So good evening. Um, welcome all to the book culture for tonight's event. Uh, my name is Roger Berkowitz. I'll be moderating. I run the Hannah Arendt Center at, at Bard College. Uh, we're, we're here tonight uh, to, to talk about and to uh, celebrate the publication of uh, Lewis Gordon's book, Fanon, What Fanon Said, A Philosophical Introduction to His Life and Thought. Uh, it's an honor for me to uh, have with along with Drusilla Cornell to be one of the series editors uh, in the series at Fordham University Press that published this book. And uh, I'm excited to have the conversation tonight. Um, I'm going to introduce the speakers as they go along and as they're going to speak. We have a large group of people who are going to comment on the book. I've asked them each to speak for about five minutes and then conclude their talk with a question for Professor Gordon. Uh, and. Uh, we will begin with Professor Drusilla Cornell, who teaches at Rutgers University. Her latest book is Law and Revolution in South Africa. Drusilla. It was an honor when Lewis Gordon asked me to write the afterword of this book, and I want to focus my comments tonight on two very controversial cases, the love affairs of Jean Venus and Mayota Capicia, which have often been read in black skin, white mass to be a simple critique of interracial relationships. And in order to set the background for that, I want to take one of Fanon's most controversial remarks and put it in a new light based on Lewis Gordon's work, which is Fanon said, I know nothing of the black woman. And of course, he was seen as just being another man who wasn't trying. But instead, he was making a much more profound point, which Gordon points out that what it meant to be black and a woman, given the conditions of the obliteration of sexual difference under conditions of slavery, later indentured servitude, and more generally, the complete collapse of the idea that a black person could have an inner life, was that what he saw, what he heard, what he studied in psychiatric hospitals had nothing to do with the black woman who could actually enunciate an eye. So what he knew of the black woman was her obliteration. It was not a trivial statement. It was an important statement. This takes us to the two famous examples of one woman of color trying to find a way out of her lack of sexual difference because the way black women are stereotyped, I mean, we see it in the movies all the time, right? They're either monsters, seductresses, are really super evil, uh, is to find your way into sexual difference by being mirrored as white. Otherwise, there is no femininity. And this is so crucial for feminists, because if we think that there's such a thing as a woman that is in any way separate from a racialization that's already taken place, you miss the point. You look at lynching in the country of the United States. It turned on fantasies of white femininity pitted against fantasies of a black lack of femininity. At one point, one of the most idealistic movements led by the Communist Party in 1931, a group of black and white women fought against lynching by saying that they were rejecting the way in which both white and black women had been buried under racialized fantasies. The attempt to escape individually by finding a way of being mirrored as whiteness fails differently with the two, fails differently with Machicha, um, Mayota Capicha and Jean Venus, because there's no way, of course, that a woman can ever mirror a black man as a man, no matter how white she is. And in the case of Machicha 
she was fated to be left. Both, in fact, fail at this attempt at a love affair. But this wasn't just Fanon telling us about these individual failures, or even the failure of an individual way out. It was pointing to something that's not often noted in Fanon, as his writing on the armed struggle is seen as so macho. But at the end of the day, you can't read Fanon, at least not when you read him with Lewis, as other than somebody who profoundly saw that the struggle against decolonization had to be a struggle for radical erotic transformation and indeed for feminism, not just egalitarian feminism, that women should participate in all walks of life, but the whole way that colonial erotic relationships had been struggled through race, that it completely distorted sexuality, had to be totally challenged. So he offers us a feminism that is intimately connected to erotic transformation, and this you get out of Gordon's book. So my question to Gordon tonight is having put Benoit so strongly on the side of erotic transformation and a vision of a truly radical feminism that gets to the ground of how we have been racialized and feminized in the worst way, but would allow us to open up a new ground for sexual difference. Where would Lewis take us now in a politics of decolonization through Fanon that would emphasize this kind of challenge to all forms of phallologocentrism? Um, thank you very much, Drusilla. Uh, we're going to have each panelist ask a question, and uh, Professor Gordon's going to take them all at the end. So uh, our next, uh, our next uh, panelist and commentator is Paget Henry. Uh, he's a professor of Africana Studies and Sociology at, at Brown University. Uh, he's the author of uh, many books. His most uh, uh, recent is C.L.R. James, The Caribbean, if I have that correct. Yes. P professor James. Professor Henry. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and certainly a pleasure to be celebrating Lewis Gordon's uh, new book. This book is a wonderful synthesis of all of the ideas that Lewis has been working on and thinking about in relation to Fanon uh, for many, many years. Uh, you can go back to Fanon and the Crisis of European Man. You can look at his edited volume, uh, Fanon, the uh, a Critical Reader. Uh, and you can really see that this book uh, is a wonderful synthesis, a wonderful culmination of his thoughts uh, on Fanon uh, so far. Now, among the many ideas that get so nicely synthesized here, I want to comment basically uh, on two. The first <clears throat> is the idea that Lewis throws out that in this text, sorry, in uh, Black Skin, White Mask, Fanon speaks to us out of two voices. The first voice <clears throat> is that of what he calls the black or the voice of the text. The second voice in which Fanon speaks to us, he calls the voice of the theorist, or the voice about the book. And uh, it is very important that uh, we distinguish t these two voices. Lewis suggests a comparison between the voice of the black and Dante's condemned sinner in the Inferno, and a comparison between uh, Dante's Virgilian guide and the theorist, right? So these are just other metaphorical appropriations to help us to grasp these two voices uh, through which Fanon speaks to us uh, in this text. <clears throat> and so recognizing this distinction, I think, is really important. It helps us to read the text differently, and Lewis really does a good job in developing this point. <clears throat> And closely related to this point is the very, very interesting suggestion that in The Wretched of the Earth, these two voices become one. So that the, 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 the writing subject shifts uh, in The Wretched of the Earth. And again, it's just a very, very skillful, scholarly, insightful way in which he does this that I, I think really, really wonderful, makes for excellent reading. The second idea that I want to comment on is Lewis's brilliant treatment of the idea of failure in both its Freudian and Sartrean senses. 
In describing the journey of the black uh, from the hell of racism, Fanon portrays it uh, as taking the form of a series of projects, projects of <coughs> self-redefinition. However, as Lewis points out, these projects seem to fail, or they often fail. One reason why they fail is that they make use of many of the defense mechanisms that we see in psychoanalysis, such as projection, compensation, inflation, deflation, etc. However, we know that when used extensively at very low levels of self-consciousness, these coping strategies generally lead to failure. <clears throat> For Sartre, the human ego, or the for itself, realizes itself through projects also. <clears throat> and projects that also make some, makes use of some of the strategies of defense and self-formation that we see also uh, in psychoanalysis. And here too, <clears throat> uh, the projects of Sartre, the projects of the for itself, often end in failure. Uh, <clears throat> And again, they end in failure depending on the level of self-consciousness uh, at which they are undertaken. So <clears throat> it is not surprising then, uh, given the nature of these projects by which Fanon defines the ascent from the hell of racism, that many of these projects fail. The mechanisms that they are using to redefine the black identity right, are projects even when not used to redefine the black identity often fail. And I think Lewis does, again here, a very wonderful job in developing both the psychoanalytic and the existential roots of this concept and making clear uh, why we get um, these repeated failures and what this means for the battle uh, against uh, racism. Now my question <clears throat> for Lewis uh, relates to negritude. Uh, as a project, uh, the way in which the black turns to negritude as a project, and uh, uh, the response to Sartre in his Marxist critique. So the question is, who is responding here? Is it the black or is it Fanon? And uh, what are we to make of the fact that Marxism becomes a vital part of Fanon's revolutionary project. Huh? <clears throat> so that's my question. Uh, thank you, Professor Henry. Uh, the next uh, commentator is uh, Q. Lee. She's an associate professor of philosophy at John Jay College at CUNY. And she is the author of Reading Descartes Otherwise. Q. Thank you, Roger. And Thank you, Luis, for writing this beautiful book, and, and thank you all for being here, and, and thank you to, to my uh, fellow uh, panelists here. Um, the, I um, would like to uh, take up this question of uh, voice and vision that Henry just, just mentioned. In fact, I mean, that happens to be one of the quotes that I wanted to discuss. Um, the the question of the, uh, the dual... Uh, not only existence, but interweaving of the voice of the text and the voice about the text, right? Uh, uh, so text being the black, right? Uh, so the, the autobiographical kind of, you know, a narrative that is the, uh, uh, the experiential voice uh, narrating the story. But then there is the reflective gaze commenting on that experience, that's the voice about the text. So. Uh, that's the kind of uh, uh, the structure that uh, that uh, uh, comes uh, into play uh, 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 that we see in in Black Skin and White Mask, and and also uh, what uh, Louis really stresses very beautifully and skillfully in in his uh, 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 unfolding of, of this uh, inner uh, drama and 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 experience. Um, as a kind of antidote to that tyranny of the imposition of exteriority, right? That that is, is, is uh, that the book is is highlighting, and so I, I want to take up that question and and um, um, 
ask uh, Luis and, and us to think about that structure from a little different point of view, and that will be the viewpoint of temporality. Uh, I was very struck by this, uh, what I see as a, as a, as a recurrent and kind of simmering uh, presence and recurrence of this figures of, of the child, right? This, this, uh, 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 and the adult, right? So voice of the text is the voice of the child, in a sense. Right? The voice about the text is the voice of the adult, relating back to these uh, experiences, right, that now become uh, materialized in, in the text. And I thought about, say, this, this moment when uh, uh, what you call, what you define a uh, situation in terms of realization of a situation, uh, uh, experience as a realization of this experience, right? That seems to be a very interesting way to think about this connection between the child and the adult through the uh, lens of what it means to philosophize. So for me, uh, uh, Fanon as a modern uh, thinker, who also comes uh, in the way I think about it, say, comes out of the Cartesian French tradition, right, of narrating one's own life, right, uh, through various sort of uh, critical uh, apparatus, really seems to uh, go back to this moment, right, the moment when the child begins to think, right, the moment of trauma, the moment where experience per se begins to appear. Uh, and so uh, the, I could ask the question first and see uh, how, what sense you make of that question in relation to what I found in your text about the children, right? The question that I have is, is this. Um, this um, kind of, we are looking at this uh, very new generation of, of, of people, not only children, right? uh, kind of insensitized by the digital media culture where the other is experienced through the flat screen <laughs> kind of, you know, a, 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 a surface, right? So the exteriority becomes almost like a the jarringly literal, right? So look, a Negro, right? This moment, right? That, that, that Fanon really brings in as, as a foundational moment, you know, as to, to cite your, 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 uh, your words here, as beautiful description. Uh, 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 this word, you know, is hurled at me, right? A child is shouting, is hurling this word at me. Uh, 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 look, uh, a Negro, right? Uh, 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 now, that kind of encounter tends to happen nowadays on online, right? So, and I, I think it's interesting to think about child as a thinker. I mean, that's kind of my starting point, right? Uh, child is the one who makes, uh, who, who begins to think, and also about uh, from the childhood experience, we begin to, uh, to, 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 to theorize, right? our world. And now this access to, to the experience of, of the other seems heavily mediated through this, you know, uh, uh, you know a different kind of you know, planes of experience. And so how do we uh, teach hmm, what Fanon said in a very raw phenomenological experience, you know, kind of you know, term, how do we transfer that you know, to uh, these idioms of, of this sort of uh, material culture that, that we live in? Uh, and, and I think about it as not only a sort of a generational kind of you know, challenge, but also as a kind of task of philosophy, right? What does it mean for us philosophers to, to experience these days, right? Because one of the beautiful and compelling and powerful moments in, in this text, as you also yourself uh, uh, recount, is that experience, right? It's like you know, how we make sense of that, right? But somehow our experience is dulled by various sort of, you know, the, the mechanisms that actually bar us from accessing that uh, uh, scene. So uh, in other words, uh, the question would be, uh, in addition to what Fanon said, I would ask, what would Fanon say? Let's say, right? what would Fanon say, right, uh, about the, uh, the task of philosophy uh, grounded in uh, 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 what we still like to call experience, mm -hmm. as realization of a situation when the situation itself seems to be somehow a function of certain various sort of you know, fabrications of media, right? And so it's also about the kind of how we educate, right, ourselves as well as the, all of us who were once happy children. Right. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you very much, Professor Lee.
Uh, the next commentator is, is Doug Visick. He has taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and he's now the visiting assistant professor at the University of New Haven. Good evening. Thank you for coming out tonight, a somewhat rainy night, uh, to discuss and to celebrate the publication of what Fanon said by Lewis Gordon, an important text whose importance is certainly not limited to the field of Fanon studies, a field that Gordon helpfully outlines early in his introduction. Drusilla, Padgett, and Q have all addressed key aspects of this text, uh, from his analysis of the black woman to his uh, methodological approach, which is informed by the idea of failure. I would like to consider this question. Given the secondary literature on Franz Fanon, which is substantial, what makes what Fanon said unique and, frankly, worth reading? Several possibilities, uh, possible answers to this question come to mind. For example, I would argue that Gordon's interpretation of black skin, white masks as a blues text is both unique and remarkably insightful. Consider the following passages which are taken from chapter four. Gordon writes, the blues is about dealing with life's suffering of any kind in an absurd and unfair world. Because of this, it is the leitmotif of modern life. Black people, we should remember, were produced by the modern world their aesthetic productions speak to the age as few others do. The irony here, he continues, is that Black Skin, White Masks is a blues text. In that work, Fanon tells a story that is retold in mounting layers of revelation. At the moment of catharsis, the weeping, the sobriety offers confrontation with a reality that was previously too much to bear, a reality without hope of normative approval, a reality in which the dialectics of recognition must be abandoned. I would also argue, as does Drusilla in her afterward, that Gordon's analysis of Fanon on the issue of interracial sexuality is both nuanced and faithful to the relevant texts themselves, which, according to Gordon, often go unread. Fanon, as many of you know, has been accused of misogyny and homophobia by any number of critics. And in what Fanon said, Gordon addresses these accusations explicitly, defending him against most of them, but also taking him to task for his epistemic sexism against Simone de Beauvoir, to whom Fanon gives no credit, even though he was clearly and seemingly profoundly influenced by the second sex and the ethics of ambiguity. Ultimately, this discussion ends with a call to decolonize sexuality, a project whose importance Gordon powerfully demonstrates. More than anything, perhaps, what makes what Fanon said unique as a text is the meta-theoretical approach that Gordon takes in it, an approach that purposefully avoids what he refers to as disciplinary decadence. And what is disciplinary decadence? It is when people privilege their disciplines to such an extent that they deny any other ways of knowing. Thus, literary theorists insist on knowing Fanon, if not the world, in terms of literary theory. And political theorists insist on knowing Fanon, if not the world, in terms of political theory. For Gordon, this is not just departmental territorialism, which many of us are probably familiar with. Rather, it is, as he explains in his book, Disciplinary Decadence, Living Thought in Trying Times, the ontologizing or reification of a discipline. In such an attitude, he writes, and this is a lengthy quotation, we treat our discipline as though it was never born and has always existed and will never change or in some cases die. More than immortal, it is eternal. Yet as something that came into being, it lives, in such an attitude as a monstrosity, as an instance of human creation that can never die. Such a perspective brings with it a special fallacy. Its assertion as absolute eventually leads to no room for other disciplinary perspectives, the result of which is the rejection of them for not being one's own. Thus, if one's discipline has foreclosed the question of its scope, all that is left for it is a form of applied work. Such work militates against thinking. 
Fanon did not succumb to disciplinary decadence, which is perhaps why his works are uniquely challenging, and neither does Gordon. There is a commitment to transdisciplinarity, to quote-unquote outlaw thinking in what Fanon said, and as a text, it represents another major contribution to Fanon's studies from Lewis Gordon. Finally, as I am supposed to ask a question, there is a debate raging even within the last 24 hours, as many of you probably know, about the role of intellectuals in society. My question is, what does the example of Fanon tell us about that special role? Thank you. Thanks very much, Professor Fizik. Uh, our next and final commentator before we get to Lewis Gordon himself is, is Nelson Maldonado Torres. He's an associate professor at the Department of Latino and Hispanic Caribbean Studies and the Comparative Literature Program at Rutgers University. Uh, his first book is Against War, Views from the Underside of Modernity. Thank you. Well, I have been the beneficiary of um, listening to what Louis Gordon has been saying about Fanon for almost 20 years. And so when at, at some moment we thought we had sort of 15 minutes to provide a, a comment, and I immediately took two tasks, and I wanted to make sure that I not only provided a comment, but also that I uh, responded to the occasion with a tribute to my teacher on the publication of his book. And so I was so focused on that, that it seems that I lost the second memo, saying that it was only meant to be five minutes and a question. So uh, you would tolerate me perhaps a little bit more while I share with you some of the ideas that I've, I've prepared uh, to you in condensed form still. Uh, but hopefully uh, we'll shed, uh, add a new layer to the, to the publication. And I have entitled this, What Louis Gordon is Saying, a philosophical comment on his work. Of course, this is only the first 10 to 15 minutes at most. I'll run through it, okay? Louis Gordon's What Fanon Said, a philosophical introduction to his life and thought, was originally meant to be part of a series of volumes on what certain thinkers really said. And there are f few more thinkers about whom it is so important to know what they really said, given the enormous quantity of quick and facile judgments about Fanon and his ideas than Fanon's. Fanon remains one of the most misinterpreted thinkers, which I think is in part a result of the very structure of his intellectual and political project, as well as of his writing. Fanon, the doctor, writes with a clinical goal in mind. In his writing, he produces multiple mirrors that reflect back on the reader and on the society and context to which the reader belongs. The mirrors are designed to reveal things that one would rather left behind, hidden, and the response from the self is often to evade the problematic. As a result, many interpreters focus on what Fanon seems to be saying or suggesting, or simply on what they deem him to be doing, rather than taking the time in figuring out what he is actually saying. The result is that we are often navigating around Fanon's ideas, taking time, incorporating them in our discussions and debates about art, psychoanalysis, philosophy, literature, among other areas, and hardly getting to taking seriously or responding to the fundamental imperative in his work, that of bringing about what he called the end of the world. So there are many reasons why we, should, why we should try to have a good sense of what Fanon really said. And Gordon's text does us the favor of making it easier for us to focus on Fanon's ideas, his arguments, particularly on the questions that he raised to his generation and that he still raises to us. Now, what Fanon said also raises another important topic and a crucial one for philosophy, I think. And remember that this is a philosophical introduction to his life and work. The title of the text highlights the importance of saying, and this is a topic of high philosophical importance in Fanon. Therefore, I thought that I would offer an initial approach to what Fanon said through a phenomenology of the saying as it appears in Fanon's and Gordon's work. Now, this is only the, 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 the first short part of, I think, a, a longer essay when I will focus, the plan is to focus on three things that Gordon says uh, about Fanon, but also Gordon says as Gordon. And one has to do with 
the meaning and significance of blackness in relation, and I want to develop in relation to the Heideggerian concept of being, blackness, with relation to being. Second, the meaning and significance of colonialism and coloniality. And third, the meaning and significance of liberation, emancipation, and decoloniality. And I think that what Gordon says uh, is that blackness and anti-blackness form a key axis of the modern world, but also that we need to understand this axis in relation to colonialism. This leads us to understand blackness sociogenically rather than purely as how it presents itself as an essence. Also, Fanon and Gordon say that no matter how difficult and intractable anti-blackness and coloniality are, it is not possible, but it's not only possible but necessary to strive to emancipate ourselves from them. So it is far from a form of pessimism. Now, in my phenomenology of the saying in Fanon, in relation to what Fanon said, I take my clue from the following. In the introduction of Fanon's Black Skin, White Masks, Fanon writes, and this is how actually Black Skin, White Masks begins. Don't expect to see an explosion today. It is too early or too late. I am not the bearer of absolute truths. No fundamental inspiration has flashed across my mind. I honestly think, however, it's time some things were said. I am going to say, the things I'm going to say, not shout. I have long given up shouting a long time ago. I have dedicated some lines to the analysis of the path from shouting to saying elsewhere, and I will take Gordon's what Fanon said as a point of departure to elaborate on other dimensions of that path from a philosophical point of view. The first thing that must be said is that since the appearance of his first book, Bad Faith and Anti-Black Racism, 20 years ago, Louis Gordon has been saying, like Fanon and with Fanon, many things. These things he needed to say and write not shout, as also, like Fanon, he recognized that shouting does not exactly belong to the arena of reason discourse. Reason discourse is first and foremost what philosophy traditionally stands for and what it, is, it tries to defend. That Fanon needed to make the statement that he was saying things rather than shouting them already indicated the kind of philosophy that it was to be found in his work. It is a philosophy that, as Gordon ha has insisted through many of his writings, is part of a path of existence, a path that is lived as a struggle to emerge as existing from what Fanon poetically, phenomenologically, and sociogenically refers to as the zone of non-being. Both Fanon and Gordon are philosophers of the zone of non-being, and it is in relation to that zone that saying has so much significance. That the second chapter of what Fanon said is entitled Writing Through the Zone of Non-Being, and that the concept appears multiple times through the text indicates the centrality of it for Gordon, and I think also for Fanon. The zone of non-being denotes a sphere of, of existence where, as, Fanon, as Gordon has put it, the ordinary act of living as a human being becomes an extraordinary event, and where what is meant as extraordinary, that is, exceptions from the human norm, become ordinary. The normal becomes the abnormal, and the supposedly abnormal becomes the norm. In Heideggerian language, one could refer to here to the creation of an ontological difference, or rather, of a colonial ontological difference or sub-ontological difference, since the dividing question is not one between being and beings, but between being and a zone of non-being. This is the terrain of what could be referred to as the coloniality of being. And so I think that if reading Gordon and Fanon philosophically, one entry to that is reading them in relation to the elaboration of the coloniality of being. Now, what happens in the zone of non-being? What happens in the zone of non-being? In the zone of non-being, for instance, something as basic as language ceases to be a form of communication, understood as a f and language understood as a form of existing absolutely for the other. Right? Ceases to be that, and instead becomes part of a drama of a subject who is made to return to itself because it can establish authentic contact with another. This is the crux of the matter in chapter one of Black Skin, White Masks on language. In the modern colonial world, the break of the path from the self to another is most evidently found in the position of black subjects who, as Fanon put it, do not have ontological resistance in face of the whites. Living in a world that doesn't grant them ontological density, blacks generally endure an affective deviation that leads them to turn to themselves to remedy the issue. That is, the move from the self's interiority to the point of existing absolutely for the other through language is hijacked by another process that leads the black subject to return to herself and himself and focus on trying to gain ontological density rather than in giving herself or himself to others. Another way of saying this is that the gift of the self is aborted. 
and the drama of a subject enclosing itself, trying to give density to itself, starts. There are at least two problems with this new path of coming back to the self. The first problem is, as Fanon points out, that it locks the subject in a stage where she and he are obsessed with their being in a narcissistic fashion. The second problem is that this being that blacks want to be, for the most part, is conceived as the opposite of what they are, that is, white. And therefore, narcissism acquires a particular kind of suicidal and genocidal component. One must eradicate blackness even in oneself. Narcissism and genocide therefore mark the ethos of the song of non-being, and you find many profound reflections about this in Gordon's old work. This is part of what he has been saying for 20 years. Now, it is only the black subject who is thus, it is not only the black subject who is thus affected. Jean Paul Sartre posed the idea that the human being is a useless passion because for the most part he's trying to be God. That is to be both in itself and for itself or to be self-determined and complete simultaneously. Fanon complicates the issue by making the point that if we consider what he calls a sociogenic analysis, we will realize that rather than human beings in the abstract, what we actually find is people and that in the modern age our ideas of the human and of people are informed if not embedded in negrophobia. If we want to learn more about our ideas of the human and about the behavior of people, we should entertain the extent to which the world is informed by the production of essentialistic and Manichaean divides between polar opposites, such as white and black. Therefore, rather than speaking about the human being in general, Blaskin Waymas Fanon talks primarily of the white and the black as modes of being human. From a Fanonian perspective, and getting to the end soon, it is in relation to the white that Sartre's characterization of being as a useless passion primarily up applies. It is the white who would seem to reflect most intensely, it is the white who would seem to reflect most intensely the passion of trying to be God. The black instead wishes to be primarily white, which of course also becomes another way of trying to be God. However, this is a white God and not God simpliciter, which makes a fundamental difference. At the same time, whiteness is defined as the antithesis of blackness which means that the black will not only endure the contradiction of wanting to be in itself and for itself at the same time, which is what Sartre highlights, but also acquire the feature of being against itself simultaneously. The project is not only logically contradictory, as Sartre's argument has it, but suicidal. In a similar fashion, because whites not only want to be God, but also do not want to be blacks. This is the other dimension that Fanon adds to the equation and do not want a world with blackness, their passion is not only useless, but also very intentionally genocidal. Having an identity that is based on the elimination of others comes back to affect that identity itself in various ways, including the use of technologies of domination and exploitation towards other whites, and the expansion of dehumanization toward multiple forms of difference, as both W.B. Du Bois and MSSA clearly pointed out, in relation to World War I and World War II, respectively. After these considerations, it should be clear why it is so significant that both Fanon and Gordon are trying to say things instead of shouting them. Shouting, crying, desperation, isolation, anger, bitterness, skepticism, cynicism, all are likely modes of subjectivity in the zone of non-being. The black emerges as a thinker who says things, not as someone who has been kept in a cave of shadows, as Plato's allegory has it, but as someone who has habitated the modern anti-black colony plantation, and yes, those ships coming through the Atlantic in what is called the Middle Passage. Modern philosophy may as well have been born there. There was no evil genius needed to generate the methodical doubt that methodical suffering was inflicting to black bodies. My point here is the following. One cannot understand what Fanon and Gordon say if one does not understand the importance that, that they are saying it. Saying is an expression of the act of communication that blacks are supposed to avoid in the effort of gaining more ontological substance. So they are both trying to achieve what the blacks in subjects in chapter one of Blaskin Waimas do not achieve. That is authentic communication. Saying indicates a move away from the narcissistic enclosure of the self and the genocidal tendencies that are found in the zone of non-being. Saying implies a decolonial process, and the kind of saying that Fanon and Gordon say is also animated by the desire to inspire and provoke other decolonial processes. To the extent that philosophy is rooted in the act of saying, one could say that Fanonian and Gordonian philosophy are decolonial. 
Now, philosophy is also about love. Philosophy, philosophy, wisdom, is typically considered the laws of wisdom. It turns out that for Fanon, love is, along with language and communication, the second mode in which subjects escape their own enclosures and become self for others. This is another way to read the relevance of the first two chapters in Blas King White Masks, first in language and second and third on love. Fanon begins with language and continues with love to show the fate of the two fundamental modes of encountering the other in the zone of non-being. Both enter in the narcissistic economy of creating ontological substance where being acquires primacy over the contact with another and where furthermore, once being as black is targeted for elimination. Philosophy then, to conclude, from a Fanonian and I believe a Gordonian point of view, is fundamentally a form of saying of love and for love. Gordon considers love to be an affirmation of the existence of another. He writes about that in the text. Love says that the person should exist and that the world would not be the same without her or him. And I actually remember uh, he explained this to me in his office some 17 years ago. This doesn't mean that he, um, anyone who reads what Fanon said will also find that Gordon not only listens to what Fanon said, but also that, that he also loves Fanon. This doesn't mean that he idealizes Fanon, for love acknowledges faults, and Gordon will go farther and more firmly than most in establishing Fanon's qualities and problematic dimensions. What Fanon said is not simply a word, but a work of love and also of understanding and communication, saying it is, and it is in that way, first and foremost, that it is also not only a philosophical introduction to Fanon's life and thought, but also an introduction to philosophy itself, considered as love of understanding, love of interaction, and love of openness to others, in spite of the brutal and brutalizing effects of the human drama in the Son of Non-Being. Thank you very much. So um, we've gone from eros to love. Uh, it's very appropriate. The mic's not on. It is OK. Um, it, it, we, the, the five commentators here, I think, have done a, an admirable job of, of expressing the breadth, the breadth and depth uh, in this book. Um, it's a book that, from its very title, attracted me and Drusilla when we were uh, first read it. Um, what Fanon said, it's right there. Uh, I think one of the you know, real uh, interventions in the book is to take it away from arguments about biography and, and other things and actually focus on Fanon as a thinker. Um, someone who, uh, as, as, as Lewis Gordon says, deserves to be taken with utmost seriousness in his own right. And his book does that and has, has made that case crystal clear. I think it's, it's a book that will appeal to experts, those who know an enormous amount of Fanon, about Fanon, and also to someone like me who, who didn't when he first read it. Um, and so I think we should say that uh, and, uh, and realize that the readership for this book could be, could be wide. So um, thank you to Lewis. Um, Lewis is going to respond to some of these questions. And then we're going to have time for uh, some discussion from the audience. Uh, I'm sure many of you know this, but Lewis Gordon is the professor of philosophy and Africana studies at the University of Connecticut Stores. He uh, is the European Union visiting chair in philosophy at the Université de Toulouse, Jean Jean, in France, and the Nelson Mandela Distinguished Visiting Professor at Rhodes University in South Africa. Many of his books have already been mentioned. Uh, he's the author of Existencia Africana, Disciplinary Decadence, An Introduction to African Philos Africana Philosophy uh, with Jane Gordon, and um, of Divine Warning, Reading Disaster in the Modern Age. Uh, this is his latest book, What Fanon Said, Lewis Gordon. Thank you. So thank you. You all know this. I don't speak with my shoes on. Um, so get relaxed. To begin with, I'd like first simply to say shalom. Salam alaikum. I'm Jumbo. And I could keep going on 
And you know I'm from Jamaica, so you know, I hope you're all keeping well. Thank you all for coming out this evening. First of all, this is the first ever book launch I've uh, done. Even though I've written quite a few books, I'm one of these people who, the moment I finish a book, I just move on. And so over the years, I've been in contexts where people talked about my books, but I've never launched a book. But one of the reasons with I decided to do it this time were, are several fold. On one hand, as many of you know, this is the 90th year of Fanon's birth. And so I started a celebration that began in Nairobi on a rooftop in January and then just going through the year through South Africa, through Mexico, through around the world because those are, well, Fanon touched the globe. The other reason is connected to the wonderful community of people both sitting here and also you all in the audience. And what I mean by that is, well, first let me begin with in terms of the press itself. You see, Roger Berkowitz and Drusilla Cornell with Helen Tatar put together a series that's really committed to something that you don't really see happening much in the academy today and in academic publishing. Because you see, a lot of people in academic publishing and in the academy are not as much interested in the ideas or even dealing with that dreaded phenomenon called reality. Uh, it's more professionalization, location, and the opportunities from publishing, which is be very alien to Fanon. It really is absurd to think of Fanon, for instance, who was writing for tenure. <laughs> you, know, you, you know what I'm saying? Same with Sartre. Same with Beauvoir. You know, we can go through a litany. If you go into the 19th century to Antonia Fermat, uh, you know, if you think about Sri Aurobindo, or some of the people even I, I, I teach in my classes, whether it's Shariati, or if I think about the way I teach Nishitani, or when I think through the thinkers I deal with in existentialism from Vietnam to China to Latin America, the concept of what it is to engage the world has been colonized by the presupposition that ideas can only be legitimate if in some way yoked to a tiny set of market conditions within an academic framework. Now, many of you know I'm not an anti-academic. I think academic work is very, very important. What I'm concerned about is whether academicism subordinates the larger scope of intellectual work. And so it becomes crucial if we're trying to speak to our species, which means actually speaking beyond our generation, really to do something called saying something. Now, one of the things about Fanon that becomes crucial that's connected here is reflected in the audience I see here. Because you see, there are people in this audience who are aspiring for the academic profession. But I see quite a few people, because I know them in many different contexts, who are just simply people who love ideas. And when Fanon was writing his work, he was particularly concerned not about whether someone is going to look at him in the narrow confines of whether people are talking more about him in a tier one journal but the question of whether what he says actually moves your spirit. Now, when we begin thinking through this, it becomes crucial to think through something like what a press like Fordham University Press is doing, or what a place like where we're in now, book culture. You notice book culture is doing. Because it's reminding us of the importance of what it is really to engage ideas. And to engage ideas doesn't mean to be dissociatively reading the words on a page. It means actually to throw oneself fully into that world of ideas because there's something very powerful about ideas. Some of you, when you read the book, would notice I talk about power. And one of the things about power that's often overlooked is that power, and there's a lot of mystification of power out there, 
But power ultimately is the ability to make things happen. You see? If you think about the most powerful thing in the universe, metaphysically, you think of God precisely because God, if God is going to make sense, has got to make things happen. It would be very weird if God showed up in this room. You know what's going to go through your mind. Your God, do something. <laughs> and it will be very weird if God says, can't. Of course, the ability to do something means it transcends our bodies. And one of the beautiful things about writing is that writing ideas transcend our bodies to reach to others. It is part of the social world that could be such that we are in this room right now and our ideas, whatever we say in the question and answer, can affect people across the globe. It's really miraculous that we, in this room, can go through this library and engage a thought from thousands of years ago. Whether it's Imhotep, Ani, Plato, whether it's Confucius, Lao Tzu, whoever it may be, the idea that Fanon died in 1961, and we're right here not simply talking about him, but one of the projects in the book was to deal with what was occasioned by those ideas. Now, you know, if, one of the things about Fanon, as some of the members of this panel pointed out, is a whole lot of people were pissed off about the things he said. So to talk about what Fanon said is also to battle with profound investments in misrepresenting what he said. And it gets even scarier in a world where the idea is, you know, you know, it's funny. There's a form of brutality we all grow up with. We grow up for instance, in reading novels or going to films in which we see, for instance, white men like, you know, who can go around, shoot hundreds of people, massacre, rape, do all of that, and we call them heroes. But if in any remote sense you have a black woman or man say that I am going to fight back, it's called violence. It threatens, it scares the crap out of people. So Fanon, precisely because he never spoke about violence in an apologetic way, made him something that terrified the crap out of a lot of people. Which is ironic because, as I point out in the book, Fanon actually detested violence. The thing was that for Fanon, you really detest violence not through saying, I want to be so clean, I don't want to sully myself by getting in the struggle against violence, right? Fanon argued that there is a form of pacifism that's the preservation of violence. If you really think, if you're really against violence, violence, Fanon's argument is you get off your butt and do something about it. So that's a very different way of looking at these issues. Now I bring this up because you see, part of what this, I bring up book culture because book culture is a blog in which I was given some very good questions to put for the blog site. If you want to see my answers, you could read them there. But one of them is, why did you write this book? And I think that's always a good question. I love why questions. I mean, it's my philosophical inclination, but you know, it's, you know, I'm not afraid of why you did do certain things. Well, one of the reasons I wrote this book is one of the reasons I wrote an introduction to Africana philosophy. And in a nutshell, it is this. There's a tendency, not only in the academy, but a presupposition in the order of things around knowledge that black people and any category of color, but especially black people and indigenous groups, because black and the indigenous are linked into an economy of presumed primitivism, that somehow, at best, what black people could offer is experience, and that if you want to have theory, ideas, knowledge, you have to look for things white. Now, the problem with this, and at first, there was a good reason why you see a lot of stuff about black and experience. You already know this. Whenever February comes, you hear a lot, the black experience. You know, right? It's usually the vo in the voice of Barry White. But, you know, it's always a baritone voice. You know, I have a theory behind that, but that's another story. But nevertheless, you know, it makes sense why you want to articulate your experience if there's a world that tells you you do not have a point of view. If you're going to be flattened out in an economy of property, then you are told you, something is done to you. You're not an agent. So I could understand that. But 
The problem, as I always point out, is that everyone has the experience of trying to figure out his or her experience. And you have to bring a theory, an idea, meaning to experience. And if you're going to abrogate responsibility for meaning, theory, for knowledge, then you're going to be locked in what I and others, such as Nelson Maldonado Torres, call epistemic dependency or epistemic colonization. So I've argued that ideas, theory, belong to all of us. We must take responsibility for it. It is part of a liberation praxis, which is why intellectual work is vital. Now, within that framework, then, if we collapse this dichotomy, there's a problem. Because, you see, whenever you bring up a black intellectual or an intellectual who is heavily steeped in looking at the world from that perspective, there's a tendency not to want that to be a book of ideas. So when I wrote an introduction to Africana philosophy, it was about showing what it is to engage the very, in other words, the very question of an African diasporic intellectual history is a philosophical problem. And so that was to theorize the very philosophy of history. Now that was in terms of dealing with a whole scale, more than 1,500 years discussion of a very modern conception of that history. And when I say modern, I don't mean Euro-modern. I mean modern beyond Euro-modern. But this case of looking at someone like Fanon is a challenging case because of the investment of being more concerned in his biography than his ideas. You can never imagine writing a book on Kant or Hegel or Marx in which most of the book is about his personal life, his sex life, and you know what these guys did instead of what they thought. So it's bizarre the moment you bring up a black intellectual, the more obsession is around those matters. And some people even argued, advocated the prioritizing of biography over thought. And you could see how this connects to a particular conception of how one looks at women thinkers. There are more people concerned with Simone de Beauvoir's sex life than with her ideas. Now, it's in that spirit, then, that project was twofold. It was a project not simply to engage the thought, but engage the question of engaging the thought. So it was a constant relationship of theory and meta-theory. It is with that in mind that I thank the panel because the panel honed in very well on those questions, and I'm going to address them now, okay? The first thing to bear in mind, and I'll start with Drusilla Cornell, but I have to add something about Drusilla. You see, Drusilla Cornell is not simply here engaging this, but you may ask why I asked her to write the afterward. I asked her to write the afterward, and I asked Sonia Day and Herzbrun to write the forward, because Sonia Day and Herzbrun is a missing element of important in, in French thought that many of you may not be aware of because a lot of her writings weren't translated into English. But she was part of a triumvirate of Pierre Bo of Bourdieu, Deleu, and Deleuze. It was Bourdieu, Deleuze, and, her, and Day and Herzbrun. Now, you know the two guys. You don't know about this woman. But this woman was one of the major institution builders and theoreticians in France. She's retired now. And I met her when she organized a UNESCO meeting on Fanon so I wanted both, not only for her to talk about how Fanon is read in France, but also for her to be, for, I, I want people to be asking, who is this woman? And begin to get her work translated and get to know what she's about, okay? Now, in a way, Drusilla Cornell is linked to Dan Harrisburn, which is why I asked her to write the afterward, because although she's here in this context, she was one of the pioneers, not only in her intellectual work, for instance, in works like Philosophy of the Limit, her work in Deconstruction and Law, but she did something that is connected to this entire panel. Jane Gordon and I wrote, uh, uh, in, in some of our writings, to develop a concept we call the pedagogical imperative. The pedagogical imperative is when we understand that a researcher, a thinker, is above all a student. So when many people think of professors, for instance, some people would like to imagine we're like Moses with the tablets coming down. But in fact, what we are, people who so fell in love with learning that we just continue to learn more. And what I love about Drusilla is that she's a perpetual student because she's always expanding what she's learning. And she was one of the pioneers of organizing meetings around African-American philosophy, philosophical thought. And in fact, when in the beginning of my career, one of the first talks I gave, along with Naomi Chandler, 
was organized by Drusilla Cornell because she was trying to remind the American Philosophical Association that there are people who think who are not of, well, are not white and not male. <laughs> Now, her question connects to this in a very important way because, as I said, Pe Fanon pissed off a lot of people. The right wing have their, their position, but what's interesting about Fanon is he really stimulated a lot of debate on the left. And he stimulated a lot of debate on the left because Fanon was critical of the notion of a closed dialectic. You see, there were a lot of people who would argue something in a nutshell that comes down to this. You know, you women, you people in the, the back then, third world today, global south, you all, you indigenous people, you should wait till you get developed enough to be an industrial proletariat and so you could enter a true universal revolution. That's the kind of patronizing discourse that dominated. But from Fermin to, if you even go earlier, if you do Toussaint D'Overture, all the way to James, if you look at the writings of Martin Luther King Jr., you could look at the writings of Lorraine Hansberry, you could see Anna Julia Cooper. You can go through this whole tradition. All of them have written some version of the letter from Birmingham, which is why we can't wait. And this why we can't wait has a theoretical critique of the notion of, notion of a closed dialectic. And in fact, when you look at Fanon's writings, there are some things you will find out that are rather curious. And to give you an idea about this, Fanon was not only a philosopher. He studied with Merleau-Ponty and others at Lyon. Fanon was not only a psychiatrist, but folks don't ask what kinds of psychiatrist was Fanon. You see, he was not only a clinical psychiatrist who dealt with the question of therapy, but he was also a forensic psychiatrist. And I talk about that in the book. If you read his writings, you notice his peculiar talent for investigative work. Fanon is like, an, it, 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 he's almost like a Poirot or a Sherlock Holmes showing up and there's this thing going on, like a mystery, like the North African syndrome, you know, or the woman of color, right? That's a question. And one of the things Fanon was tapping into is something W.B. Du Bois knew. Du Bois reflected, for instance, in his last autobiography, Soliloquy on My Life, in the last decade of its first century, that although he was a black man, it didn't follow that he had knowledge of what it was about being black from the theoretical perspectives that would clarify it. You see? So it's not that Fanon didn't know black women. I mean, he had sisters. It's not that, and that, but the reality of clinical life was one that excluded the question of the psychic life of black women. And there was good reason for this because there's no accident in Fanon's time that most psychiatric facilities had white women and men of color and white men. The reason is, really, there's something, it's just like when we talk about the police in this country. We don't really pay attention to this. You really are going to have a woman of color, whether it's in North Africa, Southern Africa, or in the United States, in a period of delirium when she's most vulnerable, take her to a room where, at that time, the entire profession was governed by white men, Lock her in a room with them alone and tell them to administer therapy to her. You know what that was a recipe for. And in fact, the history show this. It was a recipe for rape. So quite often, if you wanted to know more about the psychic life of women of color, and I did research on it, you'd have to look in social work because social work would bring up the family in the room and you had a more protected therapeutic subject. Now, in terms of the question Drusilla Cornell asks, it connects to a fundamental question that I talk about a lot of my writings, which is that a lot of what has happened in the modern world has been crises at the question of what it is to be human, crises of freedom, and crises, crises around the very questions of justificatory practices or how we justify what we think and say. Fernand addressed all of these by pointing out that, that the applied dialectic model was not dialectical. And in fact, in Fanon, and this, is, this connects to Paget Henry's question, because you see a philosophical anthropology that treats the human subject as dialectically closed fails to deal with human agency and the fact that human beings are always building relations that constitute human beings. We are witnessing it right now. Did any of, there's nobody in this room, for instance, had any idea, any expectation 
that the very core conceptions of what it is to be human beings at the level of basic sexual relations would have an impact on the very identity of the kinds of human beings we have today. Today, we have already began to adapt to the language of trans man, trans woman. We're already shifting not only to the question of, of how we look at gender and race and many of these other categories, but we're witnessing, which is connected to Q's question, new technologies of how we're setting up relations with each other that, in fact, question the very idea that we are fixed, closed subjects that take on our relations in the world. Fanon and many phenomenologists and many you know, philosophers that come out of the tradition that reject the notion of internal essence take the position that what we really are are actually relations in the making. And the error we make is that we think if we change one relation, the others will remain the same. There are people who thought you could just simply pick up, for instance, women and put them into male roles and, but keep this, and keep the system intact. But if women are relations, bringing women in are going to shift those roles. Those roles have to be played differently. You can't just pick up black people. You could try. But the goal that's to keep the system intact is not really to have black people in the system or women or people of different sexual orientation. We could go down the list or Muslims. No. The real idea is to pick them up and in putting them in, make them into what is already there. So you just have, as he said, you have a black, <laughs> you have a black skin, right? But you have a white mask. Or put differently, you, have a, you, you put the genitalia that you may associate with a female but you really have in that room a male, okay? So within that framework, the open dialectic was Fanon's critique and is a rather interesting one because you see in Fanon, there's something I gotta tell you and I talk about in the book. For Fanon, the image of death in Fanon's writing was whiteness. The, for those who think Fanon is saying, when, when Fanon says become white and Paget brought up, he really means die. And this is something very crucial to understand because even in his plays, he wrote about death in terms of whiteness. The Grim Reaper for Fanon was white. Now, it's not like white hating of white people. He's talking about whiteness. If you think about what it is really, really to be white, the imagined notion of white is that you now, as white, have the privilege and power not to be in relations with those who are not white. You control the conditions. And if you put yourself out of relations, then you become like a god. But a human world is a world of relations. So once that happens, it comes to Paget Henry's question then. Because you see, the philosophical anthropology is that it's not gender or sexuality or class or any of those as a supervening category of the others. What Fanon actually does is to try to see what happens if they are actually interacting in the production of new relations. So in fact, if you're talking about a revolutionary activity around race, gender, or any of those categories, what you really are doing, Fanon argues, is arguing about building different kinds of human beings. And this becomes something very crucial because you see, and this links in, if we get into the question of dialectics and we get into the question of an open dialectic, and we get into the question that's related to Doug Fisek's question, we begin to realize that what Fanon is going to say is this. If you are going to make what you are a closed relation to a set of past categories, Fanon called that zombification, or as Doug Fisek wrote about it, petrification. It means you are now frozen. If, however, you're going to talk about them as open relations, if it's not about zombification, then you're going to have to deal with the idea that what you're building is a different kind of world to which different conceptions of the human being are organically related. So that means if you're going to think about Fanon in terms of someone like Marx, you really are going to have to look closely for a relationship with someone like Gramsci. Because, you see, some people don't understand. When Gramsci talks about organic intellectuals, they think he means an identity. But no, what Gramsci means is that you may belong from one class, but the commitments and practice and political work might be organically linked to another. And so when Fanon says every generation has its mission, what he's really saying is for each generation to develop ideas that are organically linked to where humanity is going. You see? And those who are not 
become counter-revolutionary. Now, I wrote an essay for a volume in India called um, The Virtual Transformation of the Public Sphere. And this connects to Q's question, because you see, um, at first, when we think about virtuality, we often make the error of trying to impose old models on how we understand technologies and human beings. But what we've discovered is almost everything we have tried to predict every time, for instance, cyberspace technologies or other technologies occur, we always use a past version, but in the actual practice, we discover things we never thought of before. That we never thought of a phone in the way we think of a phone now. And so, in effect, although there is a two-dimensional seeming reality, perhaps reality transcends those, and we are now dealing with new ways to think about what it is to be human. Now, in terms of the, uh, the thing, I know that, that, that Doug is really talking to about, about Michael Larry Dyson's attack on Cornel West, <laughs> which is a profoundly bad faith piece of writing for many reasons. Um, you know, they're, they're also, they're, you know, the problem with it is that it's sticky. Right? It, you know, I, stickiness is a feature of bad faith. The problem is, if you comment on it, it can get away from the real issue at hand. Because we know, for instance, that at the end of the day, uh, Cornel West's in intellectual achievements are there, and the conception of what he wants to do as an engaged public intellectual is there. But you know, and when I was driving down, I had a conversation about Frank Sinatra. I love Frank Sinatra. Uh -huh. But one of the things about Frank Sinatra, remember Frank Sinatra really worked for, the Kennedy, for Kennedy to get into office, and Kennedy promptly screwed him over when he got in? Well, Frank Sinatra said, he won't work with Kennedy anymore. And in his case, he joined the Republican Party. But everybody knows that Frank Sinatra was not a conservative. In, in his actual practice, everything he did, he was something that unfortunately doesn't exist today, which is a liberal Republican. But the point is, I think Cornell was right in his decision. He should have been outraged to be treated that way when he fought so hard to get the president's legitimacy he had a right to be angry. He should not have been treated that way. But as we know, there'll be a lot of opportunism out there because when you're dealing with commodified intellectuals, a lot of people are going to want their piece because they'll have a lot of coverage. And I notice very much in the piece that, in my opinion, quite a few, frankly, intellectuals I don't think of high caliber were actually given shout outs in that piece only, and we know damn well why, because they belong at very prestigious, powerful institutions. So for me, it was a cowardly piece. But that's one matter there. Now, connected to Nelson, uh, uh, one of the things I have to tell you, there, there are several things I have to say about what Nelson said. One of the things that's always struck me, and this is the importance of Fanon, ever, I first encountered Fanon when I was a little boy when my Rastafarian uncle brought home a bunch of books and put on a bookshelf and never read them. <laughs> However, I was in the house, this little boy who could read and you know, in my case, it's, it's a very unusual story. I started speaking at a very, very early age, and I was reading everything in sight. And so I read these things and s couldn't understand a lot of it, but I knew something was there. It spoke to me in the profundity of the language, the poetry of the language, and I kept reading it. And one of the things over the years when I could understand it more, when I wrote on it, and in fact, it was connected to what led to my relationship with Paget Henry, because he met me when I gave a talk at Brown University, where he heard me talk about existential ontology and how Fanon related to it. And he was shocked because he knew Fanon in terms of an historicism. And he wanted to see Fanon in a very different way. Well, when I met Nelson, Nelson was about to drop out of graduate school. And he was about to drop out of graduate school because the department he was in was treating him in such a profoundly racist way that his, his sense of self, his humanity, his understanding, of ideas, what he was really committed to, was jeopardized. But then he suddenly heard that this reactionary institution, I know you all think of Brown as liberal. It ain't true. But this reactionary institution hired this guy, and he's thinking, my god, he wrote a book off and on the Christ of European man. So, found, so Nelson thought, let me stay around a little longer. And through Fanon, it developed a relationship with, with us in which Nelson's talents came to the fore. And I bring this up because of why I decided to wear this T-shirt, Danger, Educated Black Man, Armed with Knowledge. You see, if the knowledge is right, if education is right, it's an act of love. 
It's about the growth of others. And he's absolutely correct by pointing out this question of love. You see, in a lot of my writings, there's, one of the things I argue against is this ridiculous cliche, love is blind. I argue that's absolutely false. That's false love. Real love means you pay attention to people's strengths and their weaknesses, and you celebrate their existence. Every one of you have ever been loved with your husband, wife, girl, you know, partner, whatever it may be, your children, whatever it may be, you know their flaws. And you won't have them any other way. And so part of the, the question is, in fact, these flaws can be connected also to their strengths. And one of the things Fanon argued, and this is connected to the open dialectic argument, is that the profound act of love, which is connected to a different conception of radical democracy, a different conception of what it is to deal even with concepts like sovereignty, is that real freedom is for people to be able to live and exercise their right, not only to make the world better, but also in the process to be able to take responsibility for their own mistakes. There are always people, when it comes to the world of theory, trying to tell you in advance what will work and what would fail, and what Fanon just says, well, you may have failed, but who says we will? And in fact, we find constantly, even in a room like this, there were people who would, in the past, would have said a gathering like this with the demographic constitution we see right now was an impossibility. Yet you are here. What it is to be a human being is to encounter the impossible by always making it transformed into the possible. So with Fanon, then, what I would argue and I have, not even, I have argued, is that in the short life of that 36-year-old psychiatrist and revolutionary is an understanding that ultimately, if you're going to do what really matters, you have to love so powerfully that you have put yourself out of the way for the interest of doing what needs to be done. I'm done. Thank you very much, Lewis. Uh, we have some time for questions, and I'm going to, unless anyone's, I'm going to let the audience uh, participate here so we can get you in. And I will bring the mic around. Please wait for the mic for your questions. So if there are any first questions, um, please let me know. Please also say your name. And please say your name and introduce yourself when you ask. You wanna, would you come up, do me a favor, so I can... Hello, my name is David Norman. Uh, I'm an old student here at my whole, I'm an old student here at Columbia University, uh, working on a degree in philosophy. I want to ask you a question. I wrote a paper on the chapter in uh, uh, Black Skin, White Mass about the chapter that, that some people uh, translate as the fact of blackness, and uh, and and. Fanon repeatedly referred to this thing he called an ontological flaw. And I think uh, Professor Torres answered the question, but I was kind of caught up in the dichotomies between being a non-being and being for itself and the other stuff that was going on. And so I thought I had a little grasp on it, but it was kind of tenuous, and now it's gone. So what I need to know is what did he, I, I understand this, this ontological flaw to be a pathology uh, imposed or derived from the effect of racism on individuals. I would like to know if you could give me, am I missing the mark or is there a more profound answer to that, but not so profound that I can't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> Could we get as many of the questions that way, that way people get their questions in in case we run out a little time? Are there other questions? Yeah. Thank you. Nice book, and I definitely, as I promised you yesterday, will buy the book, only because you mentioned the, the forensic. When you called me and asked me about the hot ta bomb I dropped at Fordham, I thought you were coming out your mouth with that tonight. Because hot ta means inquiry, written by an Ethiopian in Africa, 67 years 
before Emmanuel Kant was born. Am I correct, sir? Because you did call me and ask me about the Hatata bomb I dropped in Fordham. No, oh, you called me. I but called yeah. you. <laughs> I thought that yeah, you do have that in your book. So on that, I will buy your book. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Well, do you want to begin? Do you want, do you want to take one? Or do any of the panelists have questions based on what Lewis was, was saying? Well, I think I should go to, to, to the okay. question there. One of, one, of, one of the reasons in my answer I was focusing so much on the question of open dialectics is because um, a lot of people uh, work with this very weird dichotomy in reading Fanon. Uh, so they, talk, they think about the young Fanon, and then they think about the supposedly mature Fanon. And demand that at, at the age of 36. Um, but, but the thing about maturity, what's interesting is, and this is something connected to what Tom Marr, uh, one of my students in the audience, is uh, talking about. I see Tal Coram here, too. She's written on Fanon and Gandhi and Hannah Arendt. The, uh, one of the things that's interesting, and you all know this, have you ever met people who are mature when they're children? Yes. And then you meet some people who, no matter how old they get, they're just so damn immature. <laughs> right? So the thing about Fanon is he was already very mature throughout his writings, from his early writings, even the plays have some of these ideas. But one of the things that become crucial to bear in mind is that there is, and this is what I'd said to Paget Henry when I met him in 92, is there's a distinction between an ontology of being and an existential ontology. An ontology of being treats the idea that there is a sort of presence-filled reality. An existential ontology, it, once you say the word existence, existence means exi from existere, to stand out. It means that there's a collapse of an, of, 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 of an identity relation in which things become closed. So precisely because it's open, it opens the door to problems of freedom. Now, what does freedom bring? Well, one of the things freedom brings is something very terrifying. The terrifying thing that freedom brings is that it brings along with it responsibility. But an existential, all the existentialists, and one could argue the, the, the people who understood from Marx to Gramsci, people like James, all the way to the present, and if you look at a lot of what's called the black radical tradition was dealing with, was dealing with something more radical around this question of responsibility. You all have, have surely, when, you, when you've come across slave narratives or you come across writings from people who are living on insuperable conditions, there's this bizarre, profoundly strange phenomenon, which is you come across people who look as though they have no control. They, in fact, they in fact have no control of the objective circumstances around them. If you're a slave, for instance, you can run one place, they'll just catch you, string you up, whatever it may be. The options are very limited. Why then do ensla did enslaved people, and they have written about their own experience of their enslavement, go through the experience of existential guilt? Why is it that even if you, 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 you know you cannot escape, why do you feel or suffer a sense of responsibility for your inability to escape? And in my own writings, I've argued that this is called a form of implosion. Because what oppression does, remember when I talked about power? Oppre what oppression wants to do is to lock you to have reach, power, to be only the extent that your body can physically reach. And that's what you do with a slave. A slave can only interact with material things. That's what you do when you imprison people. Because it means that their, their sphere of interact, they can only affect a world within the parameters of the cell. So to be a prisoner literally in your body. Now this kind of, but however, even though your options are limited, it doesn't follow that your choices are. And this has been the problem of stoic resignation. Because you see, when your options are limited, you could still make choices about how you're going to live your limited options. Do you, li do you live it in constant despair, suffering? Do you lie to yourself? 
Do you do all these things? And this is one of the paradigms of freedom. Part of our freedom is that we have the freedom to attempt to escape our freedom. And, but the problem is, the more you face your freedom under conditions of oppression, you go more inward and you, what I call, implode. Now, that means the relationship you have to those options, being, transcends them within the sphere of negation. In other words, you, even if you're locked in a cell, are, can assert your humanity of how you relate to it. Now, this is not a prescription. It's not saying that's the right thing for you to do. I'm saying because you can experience that, you experience a unique form of suffering. And that suffering is an existential suffering called oppression. Now, that suffering, okay, is something that connect, is connected to what Fanon argues in a lot of his writings. You see, whether it is psychoanalysis, language, um, philosophy, the disciplines, whatever they may be, they often offer themselves to us as ontological, which means that they're complete. But what Fanon has shown in his writings is that once you bring colonialism, racism, and other forms of oppression in, they reveal the particularity of the way those sciences can deal with those problems. If those sciences were complete, it would only mean they were created by gods. But the reality is the sciences through which we try to study the world were created by human beings. And it's in that sense that we understand that they're not being and our ability to relativize them, this is not relativism, but to relativize them is precisely because we're linked to the ontological condition of freedom. So that's what, what Fanon means by saying it has pushed ontology to the wayside, the ontology of being. But the responsibility, and this is the radical part, you see the story I just told you? The, the, the human condition is not only that we can experience responsibility, but we can also experience something far more radical. And what that is, is, and get this, responsibility for responsibility itself. Now, some of you know in my Jewish writings I bring this issue up because the symbol of carrying Torah, those kind of symbols, what they are is to take on the responsibility not for a being with a beard as God, but take on responsibility for the ethical face of the universe. And this is where that kind of understanding is linked to something Nelson and I have talked about for years, which is the relationship of ethics to politics. Okay? But that's another conversation. But it's a crucial one. Okay? Hello. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm Bernie. Um, I'm at Rutgers, one of Drusilla's students. And I just wanted to comment that I find your critique of academics incredibly, incredibly refreshing. Um, I, you know, and the whole part about coming, uh, about ideas, being in love with ideas. And one of the reasons I came uh, for a PhD is what I like to uh, say is spiritual nourishment. You know, <laughs> it's one of the reasons why, why, you know, because ideas speak to me. And, um, and I find that when I've said this to some professors, it's just like over their head. It's like, what? You know, if, if it hadn't been for Drusilla, I, I wouldn't still be in a PhD program. So, and it's because of this, this academic uh, environment that um, doesn't seem to value ideas anymore as much. It's all about professionalization. Um, so I wanted to, to know what you think of if you're optimistic or pessimistic, because I feel that it's all about professionalization, which I think it's a, it's a kind of whitening world, word, you know, it's like to professionalize, you become white, you become straight, proper, academic. Um, and it seems like more and more uh, PhD students or academics, they don't really have any uh, experience outside of academia. So it becomes like this echo cha chamber of academics speaking to each other. <laughs> and I find that incredibly depressing. Uh, 
And uh, I just wanted to know what you think, um, what you think, I mean, do you, th like, going forward, <laughs> uh, you know, it, in this more professionalized world, you have to professionalize, professionalize. So what happens with ideas and what happens with, you know, do you just, is it just we're going to become more and more closed off from the real world? Uh, yeah, thank you. Well, I think my colleagues could add to this, but one of the things I could mention is, it's, this is, a, um, I've been doing a lot of work with um, helping develop um, alternative sites of intellectual production. And among them is um, what I do with uh, the, the magazine, well, the, the, the news, online news organization, Truthout. And I bring this up because what led to them asking me to be on the board of directors, interestingly enough, was a, a piece I wrote for them. And the piece was on the market co entitled The Market Colonization of Intellectuals. Now, one of the things to bear in mind is, before I, I bring this up, the first thing I'd like to mention, because it's about the market colonization of intellectuals, uh, I, it's not about, it's more than the question of becoming white. It's about, and the reason I say that is because, you see, there are many intellectuals of color who do get caught into making themselves for sale to the highest bidder. And this phenomenon is connected to something that's very powerful in the market. Now, one of the things I, I, can't, I don't have to, I, I'm not going to mention here, but in, in other places I talk about it, and I talk about it in a book called Disciplinary Decadence, is that the market also has, and Sylvia Winter brings this up too, she's, uh, if, if you get the opportunity, really read her work. She talks about the theology, the theological dimensions of market forces. In other words, it's insufficient simply for there to be markets, but for markets to, to become almost godlike. Now, if you think about the theology of the market, it means then the market has to make sure that there's nothing that's an exception to it. You see? Now, the old model of what it is to be an intellectual is that schooling, intellectual work, creativity is a space that is actually supposed to be at the limits of where the market would reach. But as we know, the goal, particularly if you look at the conception of market fundamentalism, is to argue that nothing is out of reach of the market. So in effect, then, the idea that the academy could be a point of refuge from the market had to be overcome. Now, how much so? Well, the easiest way at first is to shift from ideas to the question of jobs. All right? And this is something that uh, there are many people who have written on this, 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 this uh, the distinction between, say, a job and work. For instance, Barbara Siegel is in here. She's an artist. She's a professor, too, but she's also, she's fundamentally an artist, which means although she has also a job, her work, her life work is in the art. You see what I'm getting at? And similarly, when you each in this room have a, a project, an intellectual project, it's not just a job if you're falling in love with it as that through which you have an intellectual home. Now, what, that does not work if the goal is to, going, is to be the market colonization of thought itself. Now, what's, what I find fascinating is this. Have you noticed that any intellectual, I'm talking about non-academic intellectual, if that intellectual makes a splash, whether as a poet, a novelist, or as a, as a theoretician, an essayist, the first thing that goes through many people's mind is, can we get them a job in a university? Why do we presume that their legitimacy depends on them having university jobs? Well, that is because there's been a very effective job done in closing off alternative spaces in which there could be free intellectual work. The more we squeeze off alternative sites of intellectual production, the more an intellectual, to be an intellectual, has to rely upon the academic framework, not as a site of research and thought, but as a site of employment. Now, once that begins to happen, the next stage, you all must notice this, what I find very weird, and I've noticed because I've chaired a department, I've seen how people articulate themselves in markets. Isn't it weird 
that there are people who try to sell their political identity as a commodity. There are people who want you to hire them at universities, not because of a contribution to knowledge, not because of a creative idea, but because you like their politics. And in many ways, even this thing we just talked about that Doug Fisek brought up about this New Republic article, it's pure market colonization of intellectuals. Because it's not really about the ideas, it's about trying to link into the economy ab about what would make a certain set of intellectuals more marketable. And it, there are people who challenge that because they'll say, what makes you presume that I'm doing this work to get those things? In fact, in my career, what has perplexed a lot of people is they don't know what the hell I want. Because there's a presupposition that if the carrot is put in front of you to the most prestigious or highest places, you go for that. But there are many people who say no all the time to those things because they have other kinds of projects. So it comes back to a very different issue. The fundamental investment is to make you seem, if you do not follow the mechanisms of that conception of rationality in the market, in other words, to make yourself into a commodity and to make your ideas commodified, you are not being rational. So if you're going to resist that, you need a different conception of how to face that model of rationality. And what I've argued is the distinction between rationality and reasonability. Because you see, there are many conceptions of rationality, if you follow them, you can come out of it as unreasonable. I usually put it this way, nobody in this room wants to be married to a ma maximally rational person. I call that hell. And so what, 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 because there's a point at which reasonability requires knowing what you stand for. Reasonability requires knowing which rules you may have to break because those rules will compromise your integrity. Reasonability is connected to the maturation processes we talked about because you see from a, from a more childlike point of view, and I don't mean literal children, because you could be chronological age but have this point of view, the world is a need to Manichaean. There are good guys, bad guys, good women, bad women, rationality, irrationality. But anybody who has adult responsibility knows that thing I talked about when I talked about responsibility for responsibility. When you're a genuinely mature and adult, you have to make the decision over even responsibility itself. And you may have to say, you know what? Here are, as Drusilla actually argued more than 25 years ago, here are the limits. But paradoxically, the limits can open the flourishing for a possibility. And so that means if you're resisting the market colonization of what it is to be intellectuals, it means if you choose it, other people don't. A lot of people want to be sold out. A lot of people want to be to the highest bidder. A lot of people don't, you know, the truth of the matter is there are a lot of people, for instance, they don't really care about what you think. They just, want to, they just care about the prestige of the job you have. And that's a very narcissistic thing that people could buy into because it good, it's good to have people think of you as being more valuable. But the fact of the matter is that, that in spite of those categories, if you are going to take the position that there are other things that are more valuable, it means once you've made that decision, you have different kind of choices to make. And it may mean that you would have to go through the hard work of developing alternative possibilities. And, and to close on this point, I'll give you an example. The fact of the matter is we are here meeting around a press that a while back was considered a small academic press. But a very creative woman left Stanford and a creative team of people came here and their, Drusilla's books used to be with very, you know, these other kinds of presses. But because we f respected the integrity of this individual and what the team of people are trying to do at this press, you see what I'm getting at? We made a decision, and not only us, others like us. I mean, look, Judith Butler can publish wherever the hell she damn well pleases. She is publishing with this press. It's because of the commitment of what the community is trying to do. Now, if you begin to do that kind of work, you create alternatives because the stronger this press gets, it means that people who are really doing intellectual work have a place in which to do it. Similarly, if you build institutions throughout the global south and give alternatives, for instance, Mah um, Mahmoud Mandani, he went to Uganda and created an institute because he wanted a place where Africans can actually do intellectual work instead of being collapsed into the presumption of simply vocational training. He wanted, and so he created 
these resources. There are a lot of people who sell the political identity, but the actual institutions we build that really create alternatives for people will enable those things to function. A group of us, when we said, look, there are people not discussing certain issues in the Caribbean, there's a very famous anthropologist, I, w I won't mention his name, I will waste time, but he said that what we were trying to do 18 years ago was ridiculous. He, in fact, one of the things he said is to create a Caribbean Philosophical Association would be imperial. We should resist imperialism and just do, get this, Foucauldian criticism. Now, talk about epistemic colonization, right? But we said, you know what? We'd rather build it, and if the subsequent generations are criticizing us, at least it's in a framework in which there's an alternative system of knowledge in which they do not set themselves in relation of dependency to Europe. And so in building that, it's now 18 years later, their volumes will not come, they will, they, they, it's, it will be ridiculous for them to come out without dealing with Caribbean philosophy, Africana philosophy. Feminist theory is taking very different forms. There's decolonial studies. There are many other areas of thought emerging. And it is not our view that those who succeed us are simply to be yoked by us to do it our way. Our whole point is for them to overcome us, to, to open up a world of things we could never have thought of. And that's what it is if you're really dealing with ideas versus simply the question of commodified knowledge practices. And this is not a point about pessimism, just the last point. I don't believe in the discourse about pessimism and optimism because they're both based on a priori conceptions of a relation to the future. It seems to me, I don't really ask whether I, w I can or succeed or whether I'll fail. We need simply to try and see what happens. So if we have a praxis-oriented model, then we will figure it out when we get there. If we fail, that's all it means, we fail. If we succeed, whatever that is, it may be even on terms we never could have imagined. And that's what it is to be beyond pessimism, optimism, and nihilism. It's part of a conception of a human being that is committed to genuine praxis. So I, know, I know there are other questions. But uh, in the interest of time, oh. we're going to um, call it here, and people can continue to question over wine and cheese. Please, um, please thank Professor Lewis Gordon and the rest of thank our you. panelists. Thank you.